Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, I work here just uh, two miles down the road, and uh, I thought I had 60 minutes to talk to you about cryobiopsies. I have 20, so we're going to make that short. But George Johnson finished a really great talk saying that we're not quite ready for cryobiopsies yet. I'm going to make the case first that we're not quite ready for surgical biopsies yet, and that'll be easier for me to talk to you about cryobiopsies. Uh, there's a lot of misconception about cryobiopsies. Who in the room knows about these cryobiopsies for ILD? Can you raise your hand? Oh, fair amount. So that's good. So I'm not uh, perfect. We're not starting from scratch then. Uh, <coughs> let's see. Oh. PC. Okay, very good. Here are some of my uh, disclosures. I'm, I'm primarily working with lung cancer, and uh, this is how we discovered cryobiopsies after watching the movie. So, but here are the contentions. I'd like to make the case that uh, the classification of ILD is still primarily based on histology. There's a lot of discussion about multidisciplinary discussion, a lot of questions about uh, how good is the high-res CT to make the diagnosis of UIP. And you have to understand in the majority of cases, for IPF in particular, not a majority of cases, maybe 50% of IPF patients, we still need histologic diagnosis. Whether we get it or not is a question, but uh, I guess in the majority of cases we don't get it because we're a little bit scared of the way we're going to get this tissue diagnosis. So accurate diagnosis of ILD is obviously critically important. I'm preaching to, to the choir here. Surgical lung biopsy is, in my opinion, underutilized, and whether that's justified or not is a matter of discussion. Uh, and conventional bronchoscopic biopsies, and by that I mean the forceps biopsies that you used to are essentially useless for ILD, in my opinion. So this is how I look at, I'm not an ILD person, I'm more of a lung cancer plural interventional pulmonologist, but when I send patients to Lisa or other ILD specialists, this has been the, the impression, you know, they roll the kind of randomly pick uh, uh, some acronym that may or may not be relevant to the patient care, uh, but of course this is not true. These, these acronyms are uh, very specific and they primarily what's important to understand is that they refer to what the pathologist looks at under the microscope. All uh, you know, RBLD, DAD, IPF, UIP, and so on. This is what uh, the slide looks like under the microscope, and this is how the whole classification of ILD uh, was established. And when you look at this seminal paper that really uh, paved the way to moving from a primarily histologically based diagnosis to this gold standard or silver standard of multidisciplinary discussion, what we see is that really during step four and five, we start having more interobserver agreement, more confidence in the diagnosis. And during stage four and five is when you introduce this histopathological data. So this is a very, very important part of the multidisciplinary discussion. Uh, and I think we've lost a little bit that perspective uh, as we're moving away from pure histology to this multidisciplinary approach. In fact, in that paper, histopathologic information had the greatest impact on the final diagnosis, especially when the initial clinical radiographic diagnosis is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And just as a reminder, this is about 50% of patients with IPF that do not have a typical high-res CT. So surgical lung biopsy is still important. And why surgical lung biopsy? Primarily because we need a 10,000 10, foot view of the lung. We need to see the large areas of the lung that are very destroyed with a lot of fibrosis and some areas that are normal. And we can't see that with tiny little forceps biopsy. So we need, historically we've needed a surgical lung biopsy to achieve this. Uh, we don't want to see inflammation. This is this architectural heterogeneity of the lung parenchyma that we're looking for. If we look at the most recent trials, and you're all familiar with perfenidone, with the Acentral, and Impulses 1 and 2 for Nintendinib, you look at how many of these patients actually had surgical lung biopsy, it's about 20 to 30 percent of patients. So there's still a significant number of patients that do need a surgical lung biopsy. And that's in my opinion, uh, uh, perhaps an underestimate. A lot of patients per perhaps would have been uh, eligible for these studies but did not get uh, uh, surgical lung biopsy. And surgical lung biopsy is kind of uh, going away. Uh, we know that this is a very, very uh, large study that was published last year in one of our main pulmonary journals, the Blue Journal. What we see is that overall, do I have a laser or something I can point with? Oh, super. As the, the incidence of ILD has, has gone up, the rate of surgical lung biopsy for all comers has remained essentially flat. But more importantly, for those with a suspected diagnosis of IPF, we see the number of surgical lung biopsy drop dramatically after about 2001, 2002. So you, you're going to wonder, well, what happened in 2001 <laughs> to explain this? Well, this paper came out, and this is from my colleague, former colleagues at Mayo. Uh, Jim Utes was the primary uh, investigator for this study. What they looked at is, 
all the patients that have surgical lung biopsy with a final diagnosis of UIP, which is the histology substrate of IPF, what happened to them 30 days down the road and what they found that out of these 60 patients, 10 patients died. Now, if you're wondering what that means in terms of fancy statistics, here's the number needed to kill. That's six, okay? That means that every six patients, you can have somebody die from a surgical lung biopsy when, you, when the final diagnosis is UIP. Obviously, this was a very controversial paper that's been discussed for years and years and years in the literature and a lot of uh, uh, bad press for, for Mayo at the time of the Mayo IRD group, which I was a part of. Uh, but uh, <coughs> when we look at this most recent data, we find the same thing. This is for elective patients, the mortality rate, and this is the best data we have on great population data is about 1.7%. That means one in about 50 to one in 60 patients will die from surgical lung biopsy within 30 days. And if you happen to be acutely decompensating at the time of your biopsy, then that rate is 16%. That's, a, that's an incredible uh, uh, number. If we look at how many deaths this represents, Tom Colby pointed that to me, he's a pathologist at Mayo Scottsdale. This is more than 10,000 deaths during that study period from 2000 to 2012. I can't think of any other medical intervention that would remain a consideration if, if we looked at these numbers. Uh, like I said, uh, forceps biopsies are useless. These are uh, neat papers from uh, uh, Anne Louise Katzenstein, and this is from the Italian group that does a lot of prior biopsies. What we know is that if you know there's UIP in the slides you're reviewing on forceps biopsies, you're probably going to find about 20 to 30 percent of them. But you have to know beforehand that they're there. So it's kind of, uh, kind of a useless way to look at it. Uh, this is the pa uh, paper that was published last year from Michigan. And their rate, th and this is obviously a primary center for ILD, the, the diagnostic yield uh, for the Michigan group is about 20 percent. So forceps biopsies in ILD are not very useful, as certainly, in my opinion, completely useless for the diagnosis of UIP specifically. And as a reminder, of course, IPF is about 30% of all ILD. So something that you want to keep in mind. So the, the ideal diagnostic tool for ILD would be something that is as minimally invasive as the current bronchoscopic approaches that we have. That would, that would uh, uh, if possible, use flexible bronchoscopy. A lot of people use rigid bronchoscopy for cryobiopsies. We've been primarily using flexible bron uh, bronchoscopy. We want large biopsy specimens, and if possible, for the reasons that Joyce mentioned earlier, for this heterogeneity of UIP, uh, if possible, being able to obtain multiple biopsies from different lobes. We, the other important thing is that when you do forceps biopsy, you crush the tissue so much that the pathologists have a really hard time figuring out what's abnormal and what's normal. Lung is filled with air, so the alveoli you know, will be completely destroyed if you start crushing them. So it'd be nice to be able to preserve some of the lung architecture and not, you know, pinching the lung like this. Uh, and then finally, we'd like a safety profile that is at, at least close to that of conventional bronchoscopy and certainly much better than what we have uh, for surgical lung biopsies. So here comes the cryoprobe. This is how it works. You get compressed gas that is pumped into an inner cannula and then it rapidly expands at the tip of the probe and th this rapid expansion really causes the tip to freeze uh, and the temperature is about minus 89 degrees uh, Celsius, so it's very, very cold. So what will happen is that you get a ball of ice around the tip of that probe and then you can essentially pluck out a piece of <coughs> lung tissue. Now one thing, two things will happen, either nothing will happen or uh, another possibility is that you start having a lot of bleeding and that's been an issue with cryobiopsy and that's why everybody's very concerned about the potential uh, adverse events with, uh, with cryobiopsies. This was initially developed for neurosurgical interventions. They wanted to freeze the brain to see what would happen once they removed that part of the brain, actually. So it was kind of an easy, reversible way to look at that. Uh, this is the modern uh, cryoprobe that we use. They go through the working channel of the scope. The problem is we get this ice ball of lung tissue at the tip, so we have to remove both the scope and the probe at the same time. In other words, we can't wedge the scope. If there's bleeding as we're trying to remove that piece of lung tissue, you may have a massive bleed in the patient's airway. That's not a good situation to be in. So we need to uh, come up with solutions for this. So I'd like to show you very briefly part of this super long video uh, to show you how we do it at Vanderbilt. This is a technique we developed at Mayo, actually. And I've, I've had the privilege to work at both institutions. I was at Mayo for about nine years uh, before coming to Vanderbilt about two years ago. And we do a ton, well, we did a lot of cryobiopsies then at Mayo. Uh, and we do a lot of cryobiopsies here at Vanderbilt. But everybody gets intubated with a cuff tube. That's absolutely mandatory. Some people do cryobiopsies through the nose in the outpatient procedure suite. You don't want to do that. It's not a good situation. Uh, so you want a cuff tube, and uh, more importantly, you want to have a blocker in the airway. Uh, and I'll show you how that happens. 
Here's a, uh, an ARNT endobronchial blocker that can be secured at the tip of the scope. And there's uh, a balloon at the tip that we can inflate uh, prophylactically. So in other words, as soon as we will pull the biopsy, uh, w the uh, assistant will inflate that, that balloon that will essentially occlude the airway through which we're taking the biopsy containing a potential bleed if it happens. That's a very effective way to do it. Uh, and so this is how the, the blocker is attached to the tip of the scope. The rationale to do it that way is that we go outside of the endotracheal tube so that we're not uh, uh, limited by having the blocker inside the endotracheal tube. In other words, we have a lot of room to go in and out of this endotracheal tube without uh, problems. And I'll skip forward a little bit. Oops, sorry about that. I need to edit this video, it's way too long. <coughs> but here the patient is intubated with the blocker going around the tube. And the first thing we do is that we're gonna inflate that, that cuff for a couple of minutes to see if the patient tolerates having this part of the lung uh, isolated from ventilation. And that's important because we, if we have to uh, occlude that segment for a bleed for several minutes, we don't want to have to deal with oxygenation problem during that time. Uh, and then we're gonna start doing the biopsy. We always test the probe first to make sure we get a nice ball of ice. A little bit unpredictable how big of a biopsy you're gonna get. And of course the biopsy are gonna be different based on what kind of lung tissue you have. If it's an edematous, you know, uh, water-filled lung versus a very dry fibrotic lung, you may not get the same size of biopsy. But we we'll always use fluoroscopy. People that don't use fluoroscopy get in trouble. We look at the edge uh, of the lung and then we're gonna pull about one centimeter. Pull a little bit more, there's a little bit more bleeding. Push a little bit further, a lo lot more pneumothoracy. So that's kind of the trade-off. And then we pull everything together, saw uh, the biopsy in, in water. And you can imagine that's the, before we use the bronchial blocker, that's a really kind of stressful time because you have no idea what's going on in the patient's airway. And then we go back in there and now we can, you know, we do it comfortably. I mean, there's a little bit of, Here's the, here's the blocker, it's inflated. So if there's a big lead behind, behind that, that's fine, it's contained. So we deflate and then we get the surprise or not. And in this particular case, not much bleeding. That, that's perfectly fine and then we can continue getting a biopsy. If we see kind of a flooding of, of the lung, we just reinflate the blocker, wait a couple of minutes and try again. Uh, and with this blocker, there's also the possibility to inject a little bit of cold or ice saline through it that will potentially cause vasoconstriction in the uh, distal airway and, uh, and facilitate uh, management of, uh, of the bleed. So cryobopsies have been around since 2009. Uh, there's a lot more publication. We're probably ab about here right now, about 50 publications. We're working on a consensus statement with ACCP that Sonia and I are part of the uh, committee. Uh, and we just uh, uh, get a, uh, a consensus statement with the European colleagues who have, have been doing a lot of these cryobopsies that will be published in respiration and that should be out uh, pretty soon. <coughs> this is a meta-analysis that, uh, that is currently under review. Uh, the diagnostic yield for cryobiopsy is not quite as good as that of surgical lumbopsy for ILD. It's about 75 to 80 uh, percent. And of course, surgical lumbopsy being the gold standard should be 100 percent. It's not, but it should be close to that. Now, the problem, of course, is that statistics are very misleading. Uh, here are four out of five kids who enjoy sacraces. The fourth one. So <laughs> the, the, the point here, that numbers really... Yeah, that's a pretty funny picture. I, I, I'm using it for every single talk for the past two months. But uh, the, not, you have to see what's behind the numbers. When people talk about diagnostic yield for ILD, they may be talking about very, very specific histologic diagnosis like UIP and SIP, you know, uh, DAD and so on, what you've heard about uh, before. Or they may just say, well, it's pulmonary fibrosis or it's not pulmonary fibrosis. They count that as a, as a good answer. And obviously that's a problem. There's no standardization on how to report these things. Uh, right now, how am I doing on time? Almost done, okay. Um, but here's the best data that we have, and these are from my uh, colleagues in Forley, Italy. They've published more on cryobiopsy than anybody else. It's a Blue Journal paper that was published last year. And so they, they essentially replicated this seminal paper from Kevin Flaherty, looking at the uh, various uh, contributions of uh, uh, radiological input and surgical lumbalpsy input, except this time they used both uh, cryobiopsy and surgical lung biopsy. And what they found is that whether you use surgical lung biopsy or transbronchial biopsies, your rate of increased confidence of in the diagnosis is the same. In other words, as part of a multidisciplinary discussion, 
your contribution of transmural prior biopsies is the same as that of surgical lung biopsy. In fact, when you look at the CAFA agreement between uh, observers, it was actually better with cryobiopsies. Does that mean that cryobiopsy is better? Of course not. But that means that perhaps within the context of the multidisciplinary discussion, cryobiopsy is actually quite helpful. Um, this is a slide that I stole from Tom Colby, who's probably the, the pathologist that has reviewed, uh, perhaps with Joyce, just Johnson's reviewed a lot of these too. But he, he, here's a wedge, uh, and uh, this is a five millimeter uh, circumference uh, circle that would represent a five millimeter cryobiopsy, and you can pretty much choose any area of this UIP specimen and still make the diagnosis of UIP. And for Tom Colby, five millimeter is what you need. You don't necessarily need, need more. Uh, important to consider. The size of our cryobiopsies, this is from our uh, recently published uh, uh, experience at Vanderbilt, it's about that, it's about five to seven millimeters on average with some giant three centimeters. And I didn't, didn't believe that, so I asked my colleague, really, do you get two centimeters, three centimeters biopsy? And yes, we do. This is a cryobiopsy, and this is a, essentially a small wedge biopsy. This is the kind of biopsies we can get uh, with cryobiopsy. We don't need that, we probably need half of that or a third of that. Okay, so uh, this paper uh, came out last year and everybody's been talking about cryobiopsy since. And this is the experience from Penn and they had quite a bit of complications. Uh, and in fact, the, the program at Penn was shut down after uh, uh, they had uh, so many complications. When you look at the complications, the, the complication rate is not that bad. Uh, we get about 10% uh, pneumothoraces. So when you compare to conventional first step biopsies, that's a lot. Compared to surgical lung biopsy, they get 100% pneumothorax because they deflate the lung every time. So we get to <laughs> see what you're comparing to. Uh, and in terms of, uh, of uh, so essentially comparing apples, you know, and, and oranges, I think cryobiopsies should be done by experienced uh, uh, bronchoscopists, perhaps interventional pulmonologists, uh, and, and that should be compared to our current experience with surgical lung biopsy, and I showed you that the numbers are not all that great. So we have a consensus statement that's going on. Uh, the very optimistic uh, deadline will be, for publication will be uh, next year. That's not gonna happen, I can tell you that right now. So in the meantime, uh, we convene a European style uh, lab uh, uh, meeting. <laughs> Much better. So here's Tom Colby, Jurgen Hetzel, who uh, invented cryobiopsy, Sarah Tomasetti, who published the Blue Journal paper I just mentioned. Uh, this is Oren Fruchter from Israel. He's done 400 uh, plus cryobiopsies. Sarah and her group, they've done like seven, 800 cryobiopsies for ALD. So they get a huge experience. Jerry Wood, that some of you know, I think he might be here today. Uh, and, uh, and we published this, this paper that is accepted and should be coming out pretty soon and that will be in respiration and we no make a number of recommendations that any interventional pulmonologist interested in cryobiopsy should uh, follow. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Here's my email. <coughs>